right, so we have a large group and we're going to get started. We've got 30 people. This is fantastic. Um, just to repeat again that this is the first uh, Zoom event that we've had with Transition uh, Annapolis, uh, Wolfville and area. I keep, okay. <laughs> and uh, with Extinction Rebellion uh, King's Hands. And our talk today. Uh, we have a wonderful panel of experts. They're gardeners and growers in the local area. We're going to be talking about planting a climate victory garden. And so I'll just uh, say a few words um, to get us started. And I'll share my screen to do that. There we go. All right. So this is our poster. We're here. This is our event. So what is a victory garden? Uh, it's, a, it's a concept and an initiative that came forward during the two world wars where families and households were encouraged to plant uh, fruit and vegetable gardens. They had uh, beautiful posters like this one. They had great slogans like dig for victory, sow the seeds of victory, every war garden is a peace plant, gardens to uh, cut food costs, and the really funny one, our food is fighting, <laughs> which makes me think of angry vegetables in a cartoon event, but anyway. Um, so Climate Victory Gardens picks up on this concept of, uh, of in an emergency, uh, as we are uh, in an emergency now, uh, pandemic emergency, and of course we're still in a climate emergency. So climate, em climate victory gardens help us all uh, for our families to increase our family food security uh, in case of scarcity and rising prices, and as a collective, they help us to build food security in our community overall. We can grow food locally, so we avoid transportation. Our food can be grown organically and with principles of permaculture, so it's sustainable. And uh, growing is a joyful thing to do and a relaxing thing to do and helps us to just manage uh, in the situation that we're in. So I'm going to uh, introduce our panelists of gardeners and growers. And I think the easiest thing uh, would be uh, to, um, I'm going to go back and uh, open the participants list and I'm going to try to uh, introduce our panelists and I'm just going to do them in the order that I find them in the list. And so I'm gonna start with you, Marilyn, if you could say a few words about yourself um, where you live and your experience uh, as a grower. And I'm going to Hi. hang. Good, thank you. Hi, Julian. Hello. Hi, Julian. Hi, hi everybody. Um, yeah, I'm calling from Grafton. I can't do Zoom, but I'm just doing phone. Um, but yeah, a lot of people are putting a, their own gardens in this year. I guess we're, people are worried about the economy, um, what's going to happen with the economy after this is over. Um, so it's a really good idea to grow some of your own food. Um, so we're market gardeners. We go to small markets um, every week um, from June to October. And I grow just about every kind of vegetable you can. And we have every berry um, except Saskatoon's here. And we have um, an orchard as well, plus some livestock. Um, so, yeah, um, I can help with anything for growing gardens, um, for, especially for vegetables. Um, berries and tree fruit are a totally different subject, but um, I, I have a little bit of knowledge in those too. So yeah, anything that I can do to help would be great. That is super, thank you so much, Marilyn. And uh, now, um, Leone, if you could introduce yourself. Okay. Um, I'm Leonie. Um, I actually fairly recently moved here from Salt Spring Island, BC, where we uh, had a family farm. Um, actually started two farms from scratch. The first one was a cooperative farm on lease land in the, together with a couple of friends. And then after four years of that, we started our own farm. We, um, we grew 
mostly vegetables um, and fruit. Um, we had, because it's Salt Spring, you can grow almost everything there. So we had a huge variety of, of uh, veggies. Um, we grew for the market, for CSA, for uh, the restaurant, grocery stores, and health food store, some private contracts, and we had a veggie stand as well. And we had a rare breed of dairy goats, and um, <clears throat> heritage chickens, and some runner ducks, <laughs> and uh, livestock, or guardian dogs, and that's it. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. David, could you introduce yourself? Uh, yes, hi, uh, I'm David. Uh, I live here in Wolfville now, and um, but I've been doing uh, raised bed, uh, small raised bed gardening since, uh, uh, well, I, I began with my first raised bed garden out in uh, <clears throat> Delhaven along the, along the shore, surrounded by massive um, farms, <clears throat> massive uh, broccoli farms and <clears throat> cabbage farms out there by the Rand family. So it is great growing territory for, for broccoli. Um, so then I moved into town after four or five years of gardening there and started on Sherwood Drive where I have raised beds here and uh, a little bit smaller scales because I live alone now and uh, been having great success doing it here. Uh, but I had to start from a very different uh, soil situation um, not having any good soil available here at all, so starting from scratch. So um, I enjoy it very much and uh, love to talk, tell you about it. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, David. Now, I'm having difficulty to locate among our participants um, either Mark or Joel. Um, if you are on the line and you can unmute yourself please do and just sing out to let me know that you're here um jillian i did see an, um, an email from mark saying that he wasn't able to join us this afternoon thank you very much okay and so joel are you there well we'll just uh hope that joel can join us and uh, if he is unable, we will all just pitch in. Okay. So um, let me just talk a little bit about how uh, this session is going to go today. Uh, we're going to talk with our panelists about uh, preparing a garden bed and seeds and seedlings. And we're going to make reference to sources of local resources and supplies to do these things. And when we uh, complete that part of the panel discussion, then we're going to open up to all of you to ask the panelists any questions that have come to your mind um, as a result of the information that they've shared or just burning questions that you've always wanted to know about gardening. Um, and food growing. And then um, we'll just uh, end the session with um, a little bit of information about uh, further reading or background that you could do to get ready for gardening. And if you're interested, how to get more involved in some of the initiatives that we have in the transition movement and in Extinction Rebellion. So that's how this event uh, is going to go. And we're just going to get started with our panelists on our first topic. And I'm just, uh, we have some, another person joining us. And so we're just gonna go on to that part. Oop, figures went a little bit too far. All right, here we are. So this is our first topic in preparing a garden bed. So one of the first things that we wanted to talk about with the panel is how to figure out, even initially, um, how big of a garden do you need to feed a small family, to feed a large family, to have enough to have extra for your neighbors, for extended family, and even have enough 
to sell a surplus to the community, such as through a, a CSA or a farmer's market situation. So um, Joel's not with us yet. So let's just open this up to um, all of the panelists to just jump in and help people with some rules of thumb about um, garden size. Maybe Marilyn, you could start us off on what do you think about that? Okay, uh, can you hear me? Absolutely. Okay. Um, well, we, we, when we started to learn how to grow vegetables, we, we just did our own garden, you know, and then we grew from there. So I would just recommend everybody sort of start small and, and get it right, and then you can grow as much as you want. So if you just have a small garden that just feeds your family this summer, but you really enjoy it and you want to grow more, you'll know exactly what to do next time. So that's a good rule. And I would say a garden that's about you know, 50 feet by 25 feet is a nice little plot um, that can be used. You can grow quite a bit of stuff in a small plot if the soil is nice. If we're talking the Wolfville area, Wolfville, Port Williams, up to Medford, um, generally that those are the Cornwallis soils. And they're really, it's really good loam over there, but the soils have been used a lot. So they are depleted. Um, down in my neck of the woods, so the base of the North Mountain, we have very clay soils. And um, across the 101, um, the base of the South Mountain, there's sandy soils over there. So that's excellent for things like carrots and onions and, and root crops. And on my side, it, it, clay is really fertile and it's really good for just about everything. But it, when it dries, it's like cement. And when it's wet, it's really mucky. So you have to supplement, you know, you have to change the soil a bit to make it work for you. So it depends where you are, but you want a, a loose soil that doesn't get too compact when it dries and holds moisture so you don't have rain going right through it and then drying your crops out really quick and then they, they don't thrive. Well, that, that sounds good, Marilyn. And when, when you're talking about 25 feet by 50 feet, are you thinking like a family of four or smaller or bigger or... Just in terms of giving people a sense. Um, now, obviously, it wouldn't be, you know, 100% of your food, but I'm just wondering if there's a rule of thumb we could think about. And, well, it's not a very big garden, but some of my gardens are only, you know, 100 by 50 feet. I have about 20 gardens like that. But um, <laughs> you could, it depends. You can put, um, everybody knows how big a cabbage is or how big a broccoli is and if you can just imagine them quite a bit bigger with outside leaves on them that you have to trim off before you eat them then you can say well i can fit 10 broccoli in a row you know it's you, every broccoli needs two feet to grow because that's how much the leaves spread out to catch rain and sun so if you know how big a plant is you can kind of just do a little bit of sketching on a piece of paper and figure out how much room you would need you need a little bit of walking room between your rows um, so it's easy to harvest, but you can cram a lot of stuff in a small space and it will grow well if the soil is fertile. Super. Leone and David, do you want to uh, weigh in on garden size? Uh, I always grow way too much. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah, small gardens yeah. don't work for me. Um, so I'm going to pass on this question. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll be, ha I'd be happy to weigh in on, on a small garden. Um, <clears throat> yeah, a, a garden that's uh, uh, 25 uh, by 50 or 25 by 100 uh, would, would certainly uh, uh, feed uh, several large families, no question. Um, um, what I have done for a family of, of two and then had <clears throat> plenty of extra to give away to friends has been really, um, well, I do, uh, I have done raised bed gardening, uh, which really gives you the opportunity to, to, uh, to idealize <clears throat> conditions, uh, make perfect, near perfect soil and very deep, loose soil. And in, in, 
uh, in the raised bed gardening, usually we like wide beds, so three to four feet wide, and and you uh, <clears throat> uh, eight to ten feet long is ideal. And four four beds like that uh, gives you a chance to rotate the different types of uh, vegetable groups uh, over a three or four year cycle, and will give you plenty of food uh, for for two or four. Uh, person family, but then again, it's going to depend a little bit on what sort of vegetables you like to eat. Um, <clears throat> some of them are going to take more space than others. Um, when I think of corn and potatoes, for example, uh, a lot of the market gardeners uh, grow, grow those things in such quantity and they're so cheap and available in super abundance at our local markets that I haven't bothered growing those grow myself. Uh, so much, much, much depends on uh, <clears throat> on what your own personal uh, choice of vegetables are that you want to grow. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, so maybe we'll uh, we'll carry on then to to talk a bit more deeply about that whole issue of what kind of soil do we have in this area and what do we need to do to improve it in terms of amendments, compost, um, especially if we're uh, starting, you know, a new bed from scratch, whether that's in a, in a box, in a raised situation, or whether that's directly uh, in the ground. So Leone, can you start us off on this? Sorry, I had to unmute myself. <laughs> um, yeah, um, so I, I actually just found a really helpful link um, to soils in the Annapolis Valley. So th there's 49 different soil types, I think. So you can you can look at this map and um, see where you're located, and then it, it will tell you um, <clears throat> the the type of soil soil that you most likely will have. Um, that's um, <laughs> I guess that's something that we did uh, on Salt Spring Island. Right? We had a map like that too, and it's, it is really helpful. Um, anyway, um, so that's the way to start. I do would also really recommend um, if you have a sizable garden, maybe uh, not for waste beds or, or a really small one, but if you do want to grow a lot of food, it may be worthwhile to invest in a soil test and um, um, <clears throat> get a bit more detail about what your specific soil needs. And, in order to do a soil test, it's it's a, a fairly easy thing to Google as well and, and get instructions on on how to do that. Um, like uh, Marilyn, uh, our soils were very clay, um, which is a pro and, and a con at the same time. Um, what's nice about clay soil is that <clears throat> there it, it contains a lot of nutrients. So if you can build it up with organic matter, over time, it will become like the perfect soil, but it, it does take time and it, it really uh, is very frustrating to um, to deal with it for the first few years. Um, one thing that uh, I would not recommend doing um, if you are in a situation of having clay soils, do not add sand. It's, it's, uh, it's a really uh, bad idea. Um, so what you want to do is just add a lot of uh, compost, uh, particularly um, I found uh, fish uh, compost very helpful, like just get them by the truckload, like a dump truck kind of thing, um, and work that in like every fall, get another load and um, build it up over time is, is one way of doing it. Um, at our farm we made our own compost as well, so we always had um, um, about 14 big heaps on the go that we um, rotated between and that's what we would use um, to plant in because we started all the seeds from scratch except for arugula uh, in the greenhouse and then we would transplant just to maximize our space. Um, let me see. Oh, and uh, in terms of amendments, um, well most soils are, you will find, are deficient in nitrogen. That's the most common um, situation. So. Um, that's why um, for, for, you know, fish fertilizer works really well for that. Um, the other thing to watch out for is that you don't add too much phosphorus, which is the P, uh, because that can be, um, it can become toxic over time. So 
again, in that situation, it's, it's good to have a soil test. Um, for some of the amendments um, that are actually really inexpensive and kind of, you know, unconventional, the perfect, um, the perfect uh, M MPK, MPK is uh, urine. Um, and some people compost that. Um, the difficulty with it is that it becomes anaerobic, anaerobic fairly fast, like the nitrogen will oxidize. Um, but that is actually the, the, the most, the closest to commercial um, fertilizer. Um, we also use a lot of um, kelp uh, on our farm, like the concentrated kelp powder. Uh, you just lose a tiny bit and you, you side dress every two weeks. Um, pretty much everything except for brassicas and peas and beans. Um, did the same with fresh fish fertilizer. Um, and another really cool amendment, it's actually not really an amendment, but something that we found was uh, very, um, really increased yield is, it's a powder called, um, it's a fungi called mycorrhizal fungi. It's a powder form and you apply a tiny bit to the roots of your transplant and it increases the ability of the roots to, um, I guess there's a symbiotic relationship with the organisms in, in the soil and it can uptake nutrients much more easily. And we saw really great differences, particularly um, with, with our peas. Uh, but also tomatoes, beans, um, doesn't work for brassicas. Um, and certain other uh, plants need different mycorrhizal uh, fungi, like uh, blueberries ha has, has their own kind of situation. I think that's, um, let me just quickly read my notes to see if that's it. Yeah, I think that's, did that cover it more or less? I Absolutely, absolutely. And, uh, Marilyn and David, did you want to say anything about um, the soil, amending the soil? Well, we do think maybe a little different, and I, I, I love all the ideas that Leonie brought up. Um, I used to use the fish, um, but we don't do a whole lot of fish processing in Nova Scotia anymore, so I wasn't really sure where it was coming from. Um, and so I kind of stopped using fish. Um, we're opening up a new garden this year um, and so we're just going to plow it you know so you plow it so you turn the grass over and we're going to let that sit um, until all the grass dies and that will be maybe four weeks and then we'll till it um, so that just sort of that's what you do to, to kill the grass and then you till it and you don't have to till after that if you don't want to especially with big tractors because it does compact the soil it's not good for it but we do. We we have big gardens and we have to till some of them. Um, and so we just do it and then we just amend a little bit as we go. The things I like to use, I do use sand in my carrot and onion beds because the clay just doesn't, um, it, it's just, they don't grow well without it. And I find it really helps with drainage um, on the low parts. And I also use peat moss. So sometimes we get a dump truck in, but sometimes I just buy those big bales of peat moss for a particular crop. So say we're putting in maybe 20,000 carrots this year, I'd probably use about 10 bales of peat moss in that patch and then just till it in with a hand tiller um, and some sand, both the same amount of sand. And it really works. We had really good carrots last year. Um, I use bone meal and blood meal are my basic fertilizers. They're organic um, and I find that they do really well and I also use green sand or I use a little bit of potash is your K um, just a little bit we're short of boron over here so some things like beets need boron um, soil tests can be done at Perennia which is the Kentville research station you just call them and they'll tell you how to how much to take and they do it it's not really that cheap I think it's 40 or 50 bucks but it's really good idea to find out how acid your soil is or how alkaline your soil is um, most of us have acid soil here in Nova Scotia. Ours was uh, maybe 5.4. I think when we bought this farm, it's excellent for blueberries, but it's terrible for everything else except maybe potatoes. Um, Cornell University is the best website, I think. Um, it's in New York State, and they talk about what every plant needs for pH and for nutrients. So it's a really good source. So if you say, make a list of the things are going to grow, it will tell you what you need. And it's just sort of doing a research on each vegetable crop. 
It's really easy. Sometimes it's on the package. Sometimes it's in the seed catalog. But beans, they don't need a lot of nitrogen. They fix nitrogen themselves. But they do need a little bit of calcium and they do need a little bit of phosphorus to grow. And so, you know, I do that and they, they grow really, really well if you give them support. So every plant has different requirements and it's just you doing the research. I also buy bags of lime. We use a lot of lime here and it really helps to, to lower the pH because it's so acidic here. Um, and I don't do raised beds because they're, um, they're great for small families, but they just wouldn't work for um for when you're selling, making big gardens or you're selling off the farm. Um, although it's, that's what I would do if I was just doing it for myself because David's right. They're just, you know, the soil is beautiful. You can control the weeds so much easier and the conditions. Um, they make lovely beds, but um, not for commercial or um, big, big, big gardens. You can just plow a big patch and, and just put everything in that you need depending on what each plant type needs and go from there. That makes perfect sense. And maybe that's a great segue. I'm just going to turn things to you now, David, just to share a little bit more about the conditions in which you'd really want to go with a raised bed and what you might build it out of and then where it's an option or what you think the pros and cons are. Um, yeah. Um, well, uh, if you have uh, raised beds, are very a very very good way of growing uh, a, a large quantity of food in in less space with less work um, uh, at a scale that's suitable for for a family, <coughs> uh, but but as Marilyn has said, not for a large scale uh, growing for for market or anything like that. Um, there are some advantages. Uh, there are lots of them actually. Um, the soil in a, it's, it's easy to optimize the soil in a raised bed. Uh, for one thing, because you're working with a small space, say a four by eight uh, bed is, is ideal in size. Um, the soil in a, uh, in a raised bed warms up faster and drains the the melted the, the the frost that's leaving and the melt water drains off faster than in a ground level garden so this gives you a chance to probably gives you a little bit earlier starting date for planting uh, the uh, <clears throat> uh, the soil in a raised bed ideally should be it should strive for uh, 18 inches of loose soil um, and if you have nothing to start with or if you have something to start with well you can loosen say loosen up six inches below and add anywhere from another eight to twelve on top of that and and um, it, it is very a very good idea as <clears throat> as Marilyn and Leonia suggested to um, soil test that um, and keep your eye on the pH. 6.5 to 7 is really ideal for uh, for most vegetables um, for a pH. Um, what else can I say about the advantages? Um, the uh, you can get very dense planting uh, in uh, uh, <clears throat> in raised beds, which allows you to to uh, grow a lot of vegetables in a small space. And uh, this is partly because you're you're doing very loose, deep soil, and um, and 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 you're never walking in the soil, so it's uh, it stays loose and and easy to penetrate for the moisture and air and the small, fine roots of of the vegetables which are uh, gathering in the nutrition. Great, great. Can, could you say a little bit more about if you wanted to have a raised bed, like how high up is it and what do you make the sides out of? Like how do you create it? Yeah, yeah. well, um, as I say, ideally if you can aim for uh, at least 12 and perhaps 18 inches of soil, that's, that's terrific. So if you already have six inches of soil to work with, um, which is what I had in my first raised bed garden. Why well, then I I, <clears throat> I gradually added up to up to uh, 
uh, 10 inches on top of that. And uh, uh, in terms of the enclosure, uh, there are different, I've seen people using planking. Uh, it's better to go stronger and uh, uh, with something that's uh, gonna last longer. Um, different woods, if you were out in BC why, uh, or in Ontario, why cedar would be an ideal wood because it's so resistant to, uh, to rot and, and happy to be moist a lot of the time. Uh, here in Nova Scotia, we really don't have uh, native cedar in any quantity, but um, hemlock is, a, is the next best thing that we have. And uh, a very good supplier uh, over here in the Gaspro Valley is Levy's Mill. And uh, you can buy uh, rough, rough cut lumber over there. So a two by eight actually measures two by eight. And uh, you can get uh, what he calls utility grade like a two by 10 at 60 cents a foot. So it's quite, uh, quite affordable uh, to do that um, uh, using, using hemlock. Um, uh, the other thing with hemlock, even, even over time, it will rot if it's con constantly in, in contact with, uh, with the moist soil. So uh, a gardener friend of mine recommends uh, actually putting uh, uh, lining the inside of those uh, of your sides with uh, with Tyvek so the air can come and go but the moisture can't penetrate outwards into the wood from the garden um, uh, so that's really what I, I would recommend uh, going with uh, going with handlock and and you can use uh, two by eights two by sixes two by tens or if you if you like the look of four by fours or six by sixes, you're you're talking more money, but uh, it's uh, very attractive, and uh, that's another possibility. Um, that sounds yeah. that sounds great. Thank you, David. Okay. And Marilyn and Leonie, do you want to weigh in on the raised beds? No, I've never done one. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, I would. I do have a question though, because it's raised. Wouldn't the water drain away quicker in our clay soil? It holds water so well that um, you know, it, raised beds here. I would worry that they would dry out even quicker. So on dry summers, and we've had not last year, but two or three previous ones were horrid dry. And watering them, you know, you don't want to waste another beautiful resource that you don't have to. So. Um, I was just wondering, doesn't water waste away quicker? Um, I, I kind of found that a problem. It is important to make sure you have lots of uh, uh, lots of organic material in the, in the soil, uh, which has the uh, has moral retention ability. But um, uh, yeah, I haven't had problem with uh, with with the drying out. <clears throat> Super. That's great. Well, I think um, we could just move to the to any other suggestions that you might have to help people in starting a new bed from scratch. And I can just share an anecdote of what I'm doing. I'm not exactly starting a new bed from scratch, but I have an overgrown bed so it's almost like that and I also want to extend it to include some of the grassy air lawn basically that's grassy lawn now in my case my lawn has not received any chemicals any pesticides or anything um, unnatural so I'm comfortable with my lawn conversion but just to say uh, a little bit about how I'm doing it, I have a tarp, I have a dark tarp, it's very big, and I'm using that to smother what's there and weigh it down with stones so that by the time that the growing, the planting time comes, um, the the uh, the live plants will have succumbed underneath it, and I'll be able to handle whatever comes up with a hoe. So that's that's my weird and wonderful way of starting a new bed from scratch. But my understanding is that if 
you don't know what's happened on your lawn or if you know it's had chemical treatment and pesticide treatment, then you really must consider a raised bed. So I'll just open this lawn conversion conversation up to whoever else wants to <laughs> jump in from the panel. Well, the black tarp would certainly work. Um, I don't know if it would work before planting. I, I, I do think we had to do, a, we had a really bad weed here and we had to do a tarp. I left it on for that whole year and didn't take it off until the following year. So it overwintered and everything. And then in the spring, I took it off and I was really quite pleased that most of the, the weeds and the was gone. They had died, and they never did come back <clears throat> all these years later. So I know that tarps can work. Even clear plastic just burns them. Uh, that might even be quicker um, because they can't really get the rain, but they intend that it causes increased sun. And so they, they kind of burn quicker. I, sometimes it just depends on how wet it is or how dry or how hot it is. Um, but yeah, tarp works really well to do small spaces for sure. I don't think you have to do a raised bed. Um, if you like a lot of grasses haven't been treated with chemicals in a long time because it's been a ban on lawn pesticides used in Kings County um, for many years and, and wolf in particular, even longer, I think. So I wouldn't worry too, too much about that. And you're going to really dilute that soil anyway. So whatever is open to you, if a neighbor offers to come over and open the patch for you with his tractor, I'd let him do it because that's um <laughs> that's going to save you so much time and so much work um to get your garden started and then you can manage it however you want from that point but the sod is thick it is tough and those weeds will come back and come back and grass is hard to get rid of so um it is good to to, to kill it off right from the beginning if you can super super duper that's all very helpful and I think before we leave this section and, uh, and go forward, uh, a question I have, but no, that'll be covered in the next part. So um, do you all have anything you might want to say about our list of local sources of uh, soil and amendments? So I think everyone can see this here on the slide unless they're joining. Um, by telephone only. So I'll just go through it, I think, orally. Um, opportunities to do a pH test on your soil samples at the Scotian Gold or use a test kit from Blomiden Nurseries in Wolfville. Um, you can get fine grained limestone at Blomiden Nursery. Um, if you need extra topsoil, there's uh, a couple of sources for that. There is LRD welding and excavating on Black Rock Road and the McConnells in Greenwich. Um, fish amendments are available. This is a little bit of a, a drive for people who are closer to Wolfville. Uh, they're near Falmouth at Baldwin's Nursery and um, good locations for Compost are uh, the Scotian Gold in Colebrook and the Northridge Farms near Berwick. So just opening up to the panel, any other um, uh, inputs on that? And we also have a question that's come in, which is, um, are all of these resources still open or not open or anything that you might know about that? They're absolutely all available. There is no, not going to be any slowing down of goods needed for farms um, or workers or everything. So the food chain should continue un uninterrupted. You just, it just may be a little bit more of a wait to get it because some of them you have to call in. They're going to accumulate your order. Then you pay and they'll put it in your vehicle or your truck and you'll drive away. I did want to add bone meal and blood meal. Um, I would recommend that you buy a big bag. It's much more cost effective than buying little things at the garden centers. Um, but at, say at Scotian Gold, you can get 25 kilogram bags of fish meal. You can get 25 kilograms of blood meal and bone meal, um, potassium and all that things you can get the big bags. And even if you don't use it all in one year, it's good. You just, you know, seal it up and store it away and you can use it for the next few years. Um, so it's much better, much more affordable. Uh, Jillian? Yes. Yeah, I would add to that yeah, the same uh, 
at Baldwin's Nursery, the uh, the kelp uh, fish uh, seaweed meal uh, again. It's in thirty seven pound bags, so uh, it's a good size bag and probably uh, <clears throat> last you several seasons. Although you can use it in your uh, uh, in your flower beds uh, as well and for other things besides your vegetables. Just coming back to your uh, your garden conversion from the lawn. So in, ad in addition to looking at uh, your grass, it's you you want to look at what have you got under the under the grass for for soil to work with, and if you if you just got uh, not much there in terms of uh, useful topsoil, why then you might want to uh, definitely decide on going with raised beds. And um, yeah, the one of the other things about raised beds that I didn't mention. To get started probably with your setup there, you're probably gonna to wanna to have a rototiller or something of that sort come in and, and help prepare the soil for the first go at it. But subsequently, if you've got raised beds, no more rototilling in the future. So if you've got one, you can sell it or you don't have to hire anybody annually. It's a very low maintenance, uh, very little work to get going. Uh, once you have set up raised beds and that, that soil is all loose and just takes a little uh, a little amending in the spring and a little loosening up lightly from the top. That is super and we have um, I think before we leave this section there's a a few more questions that are coming in on the chat so I'm just going to ask you all. Um, the first I think is for um, Marilyn um, Will, um, do you have a way, I know you're coming in on the telephone, but you had mentioned the Cornell University website. Is there anything more you could say about it so people could find it in a Google search um, to, to sort of under, get that background detail uh, plant by plant on the, the nutrition and amendments that they need? Oh, okay. Um, I think what I did was some years ago, say I was having a problem with carrots, and I was originally having, so I just Googled um, diseases in carrots, and up came Cornell University as one of the sites. And so it had the most information about diseases in carrots, um, as well as photographs. And so that I just found it to be a really good one. Um, all of the university or government sites are the best. If you're talking about a backyard garden site, it's, it may not be accurate. You can get just as good and more complete information from any government site, even if it's in the US or the university site. Cornell University teaches organic agriculture. That's why they are such a good resource to have. Um, and to, to, it will explain everything and many of the common paths and I also have a wonderful handout that I found by quite by accident last year um, on all the pests of garden vegetables. And it has all kinds of pictures of the insect and the disease or the effect that it has on plants. So it was, it's a really, really good resource to know, to look at something and go, I think I've got that. And then you know what to call it. And then you can know how to reach out and get some help about how to treat it. And Perennia is a really good resource because they're there as an outreach service for anybody who's gardening or farming. Oh, no, that sounds really fantastic. And maybe I can just ask you a follow-up question a little bit different, which is, do you know where people could search for a website that would give them some general information on the kind of soil in their area of the valley? I mean, I know there's a, a really old soil map that divides the valley in sections. It's a government resource. I can't quite remember even where um, I got it from other than just randomly searching for soils in the valley. But if any of you could recommend something where people could learn more about valley soil types. Well, I've been on the, the No Farms No Food group for a dozen years and there is no resource like that I don't think um, that there is that old map it's from 1968 okay. and the province did it <laughs> and it's a wonderful map it's a wonderful map and it will even tell you what grows best in it but times have changed and we can really change soils to grow just about anything um, that we want don't forget that in a lot of residential areas like the town of Wolfville the topsoil was all stripped off to build the house 
um, it was beautiful farmland at once, but it, you know, it, it, the so topsoil has been stripped, and that's why it does really work probably the best if you are in an urban center and you want to have a backyard garden to use raised beds because you may not have any topsoil left um, on, on your backyard anyway. Um, and a lot of that was scraped off and it was sold to the city, you know, so a lot of Kings County farm soil went to um, b go on people's lawns in the city because, you know, Halifax County has a lot of rock. <clears throat> so. That sounds like a really good advice and something to really think about. You're living in the valley, but that's not necessarily valley soil around your house. And so that's a, a really great uh, reminder for people. Um, we have another Dylan, question. Yeah, oh, okay, yeah, go, just, uh, go for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, let me just uh, sort of affirm that. Um, uh, that was the situation in my house. Uh, clearly under this very thin, thin veneer of uh, uh, topsoil, and, and, and I don't know if I could really call it sod, a little bit of grass and weeds, um, there was what looked like uh, construction backfill uh, heavy clay and full of rock and stone and uh, just uh, pretty well impossible to uh, to do anything uh, in terms of gardening unless you wanted to struggle for years at rebuilding it all. So yeah, yeah. Raised, the, the raised bed thing then was the answer. No, that and makes to, uh, yeah, so when <clears throat> before before I started um, the farm on Salt Spring, we had bought um, a three acre property and my goal at the time was just to grow food for our family and I thought well I can do that on you know three acres and it turned out that um, it was on bedrock so that that's how I ended up you know actually um, leasing farmland um, but I did try to build up the soil and then there was literally maybe half an inch of soil the rest was bedrock and so wow so I did it the permaculture way with the lasagna layering and all that and um, and I was actually fairly successful. It was uh, particularly, you know, the raspberries I, I bought, like big bales of, of hay, and I planted them right into the bales. And um, I had gorgeous raspberries the year, the year after. So it, it is definitely possible to build it up. It is a lot of work, but um, I, I don't think um, <laughs> I don't think the situation here is as dire as as you know what I had on my mountain there with the bedrock, like you will have more soil to work with here, I think, than we did. But there, there's just, there's um, definitely also advantages to uh, working, you know, on, on the earth as opposed to base beds. Like you don't get as many problems with pill bugs or other things that like, um, <clears throat> that like the wood. And it's also, you can, I, I find, I can, I can you know, I, I like the two feet width um, for beds so that you can easily, uh, or actually three feet, so that you can easily access it on, on both sides. Um, and it's also easier for irrigation, like you can put drip lines down and I don't really, um, I don't really know how you would do that with base beds actually, except for overhead watering but, um, with a watering can. But yeah, there's, there's definitely different ways of doing it, I would say, and uh, it's, it's whatever your preference is. Yeah. Well, thanks. Well, big thanks to our panel. I think we have Still a lot of questions about soil and amendments that are coming in on the chat, but I think we will uh, change the topic now, but we can come back um, to these questions in the question and answer session later, just to make sure that we don't cut short the discussion of what it is we're going to put into this garden bed so that we have something to eat. And just before, um, oops, now it's, so, um, Mark is in here with us, so we're not going to be able to spend time on the Hugo culture bed, but this is an image just to show you what the heck he was going to be talking about. He's had a lot of good luck in creating Hugo culture beds, which are essentially beds where you dig down and you put in logs and trees and brush, and then you build up your bed on top of that, which gives a lot of nutrition for your plants to grow from over a very long period of time and maybe what we'll be able to do we should talk uh, at the end of this session about future sessions and maybe we can bring Mark back to explain that but mm -hmm. again you can google it and uh, and learn more about that so we're going to move to our next session which is what are we going to put in that garden seeds and seedlings 
So um, we're going to kick off talking about what the heck, there's all these different kinds of seeds, heritage, there's open pollinated, there's hybrid seeds, there's bad seeds like GMO seeds. So um, Leonie is going to kick us off what to do. <laughs> there's all these seeds. Sorry, that mute button, I keep forgetting about it. <laughs> um, yeah, so let's, yeah, let's talk about hybrid seeds first. Um, they, they are seeds that you really have to buy um, each year or for however long, you know, the, the seed will, will last you. Um, because they, if you, if you were to try to save seed from hybrids uh, plants, um, they won't come through to, to the parent plants. So, um, there are advantages and disadvantages about hybrid seeds. Of course, the fact that you can't seed save is, is a, a big disadvantage. Um, but, uh, but some of the advantages are that these seeds are specifically grown with um, a certain thought in mind, for instance, like disease resistance um, or, or yield or, or shelf life or, you know, there, there's, there's different reasons. Um, or, or and so some don't some plants won't bolt as quickly as, as others. So, in the, in um, initially um, we were mostly using heritage seeds, and oh, over the years I have been starting to become more selective with, or recognizing that hybrid seeds have a place as well um, in the, in the garden because they're um, also the her the heritage seeds. Um, have you know the, the the really great advantage of heritage seeds is that they are um they have adapted to local circumstances but they're changing so rapidly now that um i don't know i, I don't think that um, the seeds themselves are evolving as fast as climate changes so what used to be good for our local climate may may not be anymore or three years from now or whatever so so we may have to adapt faster um, than the seeds naturally can. Um, so to go back to heritage seeds, so they're also known as heirloom seeds or open pollinated seeds. So um, there's certain plants um, are a, a certain plants you, um, are easier to keep seeds, seeds from than others. For instance, tomatoes and peppers are very easy to collect seeds from. Um, uh, lettuce is uh, doesn't cross pollinate very easily either, but you have to wait till the plant has bolted and gone, gone to seed, and you have to collect the seed at the right time. Um, not wait for a windy day when they all scatter. Um, peas and beans are easy to to save as well, but things like um, um, particularly uh, squash and members of the squash family, cucumbers, they cross pollinate very easily. So if you want to keep seeds from those plants, you can, and I would uh, definitely recommend, you know, Googling how to, how to do it. Uh, it will require cages, so protecting the, the flowers so they can't cross pollinate with other plants. Um, and often cross pollination can can happen even from a kilometer distance. So even if you have you know only one variety growing in your garden, your neighbor may have a different variety and they may cross pollinate as well. There, there's actually um, uh, one one uh, resource book on this that I really liked is Dan Jason's uh, book called uh, Saving Seeds. Um, he's a Salt Spring Seed. He has a Salt Spring Seed company, which is quite well known. Um, Oh yeah, and I guess the, the sorry, I'm just reading my notes here. Um, one disadvantage of the hybrid seeds, I should go back, is that uh, they can be quite expensive. For instance, um, I remember sometimes looking at um, uh, researching uh, cucumber varieties that do extremely well in, in greenhouse environments, and they can be a dollar fifteen a seed or something. <laughs> like it's uh, some some of those prices are pretty uh, pretty steep. Um, yeah also with the heirloom seeds of if you want to keep uh if you want to save seeds uh, it can be it is always best to save seeds from a, a larger population to take it from multiple plants and if you cannot do it for more than 48 plants you should probably not save them for for more than two years in a row and you should get a different population and just to um to keep those seeds really vigorous. Um, I think that's 
most of my notes here on the, on this topic. Thank you. Well, let's open it up to uh, Marilyn and David. What do you think about choosing wisely in uh, seeds? Um, I think everything Leonie covered it very, very well. Um, I generally use more hybrids um, because they are, um, the uh, seeds to me are not that expensive for our standard of living is high. Um, and so, you know, seeds are quite affordable for most Canadians um, to buy them every year. And then they are, they do have a lot of pluses in them. So they're bred for good looks and disease resistance and tolerance to drought and, or heat in the summer, all those things. So for a new gardener, it, there, you really get much more satisfaction using hybrids because you have more success and you won't get, get discouraged. With heritage or heirloom ones, it can be a little daunting sometimes to get them to grow. Um, and there are lots of um, lots of seeds. Like I, I do both, you know, of course, uh, like pumpkins. I always buy heirloom ones and, um, you know, and they get pollinated by insects. You have to have the flower open to the environment so that insects can pollinate them. And I, and, and uh, you know, but I do tend to use more hybrids where you can't save the seeds and things like that. Yeah. Super. David? Yeah, I, I, I echo uh, what Marilyn has said. Um, and uh, I do have some favorite hybrids, uh, but I do use some heirloom as well. And uh, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I'm, I'm good with uh, with those thoughts that are down. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Any seed that has a color on it is usually um, chemical treated. So there are um, <clears throat> um, like corn seeds, if they're pink, for instance, they're treated um, with a chemical for a corn borer beetle and things like that. So you want to avoid all chem you know chemically treated seeds if you're trying to grow organically. And a lot of these seed companies, I use Johnny's almost exclusively. It's from Maine. It's a small company. They're really great. And the, the customer service is like bar none. I've never, ever been put on hold and waiting and, and treated like a number with them. They're really good. They, they send it out that day and you get it when they say you're going to get it. And, and you don't have to pay HST and you don't have to pay duty on it um, because it's seeds. And um, they have organic seeds, heirloom seeds. They have hybrid seeds. There's no GMO. Um, so it's really, really good company. And William Dam in um, Ontario is sort of the same company, but sort of the same idea, but it's Canadian. Okay, those are, that's great. So just to add to our, our uh, resources list, um, we're getting a, a question in on the chat what does it mean when it says that seeds are organic? Uh, what is that? I can speak to that. <laughs> um, we actually, our farm was certified organic. So we, um, so we, were, um, we were supposed to buy only organic seeds unless we could prove that we couldn't find them in the variety that we were looking for. And so we, have, we had to do at least three searches. Um, so basically organic seeds are grown on organic farms. So they have the organic certification um and the, that's really the only difference like so you're supporting uh seed companies that are doing it organically and they usually charge a bit more and sometimes quite a bit more and it can be a bit of a problem but overall it's the i don't find the price increases increases or differences too too huge does that answer your question absolutely absolutely let's turn to starting seedlings so you know we're coming i think i hope we haven't gone past to the right time that people could um if they were able to get some seeds start seeds growing inside that could be placed in the garden later now of course some people might have the benefit of having a greenhouse but probably most people don't, but might have a sunny window that would enable starting seedlings off. So does anyone want to weigh in with some advice on how you might um, learn a little bit more about how to do this or how you might do this to start seedlings? 
or what the advantage of starting seedlings is even? Well, it gets your vegetables to market quicker. <laughs> so, but yeah, a lot of things actually prefer to be started indoors. Um, um, for once, onions. I started mine in February, but it doesn't mean you can't start them now. Um, I would not buy the little cell packs from the garden centers. Just go to Scotia and Gold and, and ask them to give you, you know, you, you get sheets of them and trays. They're much less expensive. Big growers, of course, someone like Joel maybe or, or even bigger farms would probably get a whole pallet of them and then share them between, you know, farms. So, um, but Scotia and Gold is a really good resource for, they're sort of for the medium to large gardeners and small farms. That's a really good place to stuff. And uh, I get a nice big bale of grower mix and then, you know, just fill them up and start start seeding. You don't need to add anything to a grower mix. It's got everything in it. But I would highly recommend that you buy solid trays rather than the ones with holes in it for starting seeds because you should water them from the bottom. So you water the tray and then set the cell packs in them and then water soaks upwards. And um, the things that you need to plant now are onions in particular, um, some herbs and kohlrabi and the, the, you know, my broccoli is planted. I'll be planting cauliflower next week and, and things like that. But um, so the cold crops and lettuces, all my lettuces are, are planted my first batch. So cold crops can get planted now. In, in a sunny, like in a sunny, packs. sunny window in cell packs. Sunny window on a table, make sure you have uh, protection for the table. So in case one of them does have a pinhole in it, that you don't ruin the wood. So put a nice um, plastic sheet over the table or whatever and get them in the sun. You can even put lights um, on them too and just have the lights going until you go to bed. Um, and uh, my greenhouse isn't heated, so I don't put anything out there really until um, mid to late April anyway. Okay, so even you are starting inside, so that's good to know. Inside, yeah. We've yeah. got several big sunny windows, and it's all full of plants. <laughs> A oh, bunch of rooms good. are full of plants. <laughs> <laughs> well, most of us have windows. There is hope. <laughs> <laughs> So, David, have you started any seeds yet? Or? Uh, yes, yes, I've got, I've got some onion seeds. I've got uh, broccoli and cauliflower started, and, uh, and I have a beautiful big south-facing bow window. So, yeah, things are on the move. Amazing. But it's not too late for everyone participating on this call to get that going in the, during the next week or so. Right? No, not at all. It's no, because what the, you know, if it, if I get my onions in July, but who cares as long as you get onions. So if you're planting them now, you may not get them till early September, but that, that's okay. Right? So just get the do at the very first thing is get your onions and don't use old seeds. You have to use fresh seeds every year. They just don't germinate well and don't overwater them and they do need light and I do trim them. Um, I don't know if you're supposed to, but it works really well for us. When they get over three inches long, I give them a haircut and that keeps them short, strong and standing up straight rather than getting tangled up with each other. So. Oh no, that's a really good point. I've had that where I was too excited to grow seeds and they grew kind of spindly because they're inside and they're not getting any wind or any you know, conditions that would make them grow strong. So you, yeah, I think that's a really important point that it's okay to keep them short. I think um, I've heard like, if they just have two or three leaves, that's good, like not too big. It's only onions though <laughs> that you can cut. <laughs> yes. Oh, it's only it? onions. <laughs> oh, Don't shoot. trim anything else. <laughs> oh no, okay. <laughs> So, so timing, then timing is everything. If you shouldn't trim any others, then you want to time them nicely so they don't grow too spindly in your house before it's time. Yeah, like cauliflower. Like cauliflower, once it comes out of the soil, I find if it's, if it's, I haven't started mine yet because it doesn't do well transplanting if it's more, more than five weeks before it gets planted in the garden. 
So it's one of those ones. I am going to do it really soon, but I have lost several of them from planting them too soon. So I'd say cauliflower is one of the most sensitive ones. It just wants to be in a cell pack for five weeks, that's it, and then it wants to be outside, and it can tolerate a lot of cold. But I use row covers, so I cover most of my crops anyway. So the, the broccoli and kohlrabi and, and cauliflower all get cabbages. They all get covered anyway, so they've got an extra layer to protect in case there is a, a late frost or a, a late little snowfall. <laughs> Meriden, do you pot up uh, some of your uh, plants, like your tomatoes and peppers, and um, just once they, once they grow too big for the cell pack? just to kind of tie them over until they... Yeah, sometimes I replant them into bigger pots if it's still too cold, especially tomatoes and peppers. Um, they often get replanted into a, a bigger pot so that they get, you know, and I'll even maybe put a little bit of dissolved um, fish meal or kelp or even blood meal or whatever and water that in just to give them a little extra boost. Um, yeah, sometimes our springs are long and cold and uh, you don't want to be having to worry about covering up your tomatoes and peppers every night for weeks on end. So you might as well plant them out when it looks really, really safe to do so. Oh, that's good advice. That's good advice. Should we um, go on a little bit and talk about um, this, this whole timing issue? Like, you know, what, what do you plant in the early spring? Do you plant anything in the summer or the late summer for harvesting later? Like how, in terms of, you know, typical vegetables that people like to eat? Um, yeah, I have, I have, I offered this, it's my garden notebook. It's, you know, it's one page per vegetable. And it's just based on my experience, sort of how I prep the soil very generally, right? And then when I cell pack, if I do cell pack them, some of them like to be direct seeded. They don't want to be like beans. You would never put them in the cell pack. You can just, they love the hitting the hot soil. Um, so it's just good to know all that stuff and how long a seed is good for too. So can you save some of those seeds for a couple of years uh, or do you throw them away? Um, if you don't use them. So anybody that wants that can just send me an email and I'm happy to share that. It's my own personal garden book and there's gonna be stuff in there that's of no interest to you because it may say how many plants I'm planting for the market this year, but it's, but it's all relevant stuff of how I mulch them and which ones get row covered and what pH they need and, and uh, how long to, to harden them off before you put them in the garden. So. It's just all learning by experience and then reading, you know, your, your seed packages or reading your seed catalog before and writing down some notes or when you have a problem, you go, okay, why are the beets not doing well? And when you start investigating, you go, aha, I need to do this next year. And that's what I do. And then if it works, I incorporate it into my book. So, um, cause you can't really go through every vegetable, it would take hours. Um, and it is sort of people just have to make a list of what they would like to grow and then do a little research or they can have this book. And it's, it's, I'm not saying it's, it's hundred percent accurate, but it's, it's, it works for me. And we sell a lot of beautiful, beautiful vegetables. So. I think that's a really, really lovely resource to offer Marilyn. Yeah. Yes, and um, we'll share some email addresses at the end of the talk, and that might be the best way that people can reach us and um, through us receive um, Marilyn's uh, wonderful resource, as well as um, the PowerPoint presentation or you know anything else that you think would be helpful that we can make available to everybody. So just to throw that out early. Um, we're making a website too for Transition Will Fill Area, but that might, and eventually we'll make everything available there. But for now we can use email to help share information with each other. Um, David or Leone, do you want to weigh in on this topic of, um, how do you make plants for what to grow early? What do you grow early? What do you plant later? 
um, so because the season is so different on Salt Spring, like I, yeah, like Marilyn, I had it all, I have many, many, you know, <laughs> uh, files of that, that I, notes that I kept over the years. And, um, and I, I would do, I would do seedings every week. I actually worked very um, strictly with rotations. We did um, um, a lot of letters every week. And uh, um, so, yeah, I really believe in uh, particularly those things that grow really fast to keep on top of it and keep rotating, keep rotating, because you get so many rotations out of the season, not quite as many here, I, I think, as we see that. Um, and then the other thing, too, and I actually did want to mention um, a book that is probably that was really uh, valuable to me and a lot of people like it. It's um, by Elliot Coleman, the Winter Harvest uh, Handbook, and it's all on how to extend the season. Um, so he works a lot with uh, tunnels, with um, coal tunnels and uh, hoop houses and things like that. And um, his soil is very fluffy as well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm actually, you look at the pictures and, the, the, and it just looks ridiculous. It looks like pollen soil. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's, it's, it's actually a real farm and he grows incredibly uh, intensively um, on, on little lands. You know, it's, it's, it's quite marvelous. Very few people can replicate it, but you know, he's able to do it. And he does have a very good, um, really you know, good instructions for how to extend the season and so um, um yeah so anyway so i wanted to mention that and david yeah well while we're on that on that topic of uh, resource uh, resource books uh, one that uh <clears throat> that i would also recommend is a, a book by nikki and jabur and she is uh she actually uh, lives in gardens in Maine, where the, the uh, climate is rather like ours, and has written a book called The Year-Round Vegetable Gardener. And uh, the same thing, she, she talks about planning for gardening, uh, for spring planting, summer, fall, winter, uh, and again, using, uh, using various devices, coal frames, uh, um, mini hoop tunnels, uh, greenhouses, unheated greenhouses the whole thing. And again, in her book, um, she treats every individual veg uh, vegetable uh, with its nutrition requirements, uh, best ideal, best uh, sort of planting, ad planting and harvesting advice. And uh, she has given uh, actually two or three different workshops right here in, uh, in Nova Scotia, both in Halifax and here at uh, um, uh, Blumina Nurseries. Uh, she gave one that I attended back in uh, uh, around 2006 or so uh, that really got me started on the whole uh, raised bed gardening thing. Um, and that, that's one book. And then there's another one that I uh, also really highly recommend called The Vegetable Gardener's Bible by Edward Smith. And again, it does, it does the same thing uh, uh, very, uh, <clears throat> very entertaining and uh, informative treatment of um, raised bed gardening and uh, different types of gardening and, and a terrific individual treatment of every vegetable, its nutritional needs, pH, ideal pH, uh, harvesting and planting advice and, uh, and, and uh, great, it's a great read and uh, uh, it's, uh, I consider it a, an, in, an indispensable companion when I'm uh, planting my garden in the spring. Mm -hmm. That sounds fantastic. Well, I'm wondering if this is bringing us to the right time to open this up so that people can ask um, the questions that they have for you. And if there are questions we didn't make it through uh, a couple of the topics here on the list about plant combinations and um, growing perennials, but I just suggest that people ask you questions about those and about anything else. We've got quite a lot of questions that have come through um, on the chat, and if there's a quiet moment, I'll refer to them, but otherwise ask your question now. So here's how we're going to do it. If you're using, you're all on Zoom, if you've got Zoom on a computer or a tablet or a smartphone, 
then please go to the participants tab and uh, click on raising your hand. Uh, and if you have any trouble to raise your hand, then just shout out on the chat that you want to raise your hand and, and I'll take note uh, of it that way. And so let's see, uh, no one's raised their hand yet. We're looking for someone to raise their hand. It's your turn to ask our panel questions. Maybe while you're thinking of the question that you want to ask, David can tell us a little bit. Oh, nope, never mind. We have a first question um, from Janet. Janet, go ahead. Okay, I'm getting a little delay. Sorry, Janet. Hello. Uh, oh, there you go. Perfect. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, I have several questions, but just the the one on the Marilyn mentioned uh, herbicides, pesticides are are banned in Kings County, but I see spraying, and I always have to ask when I'm at the markets if, or I'm always looking for it to say no spray and if they if I, I'll ask are these carrots organic and said no but these ones are so I don't I don't really understand that the other th one was the in like how do you keep rabbits out of your garden and insects but I can always research that if we don't have time but I just wondered about local I think you, you um hi Karen I think you do have to ask your the farmer um whether they're See, being organically certified, that's one thing, but there are farmers that are, are not certified. There is an expense to that, um, right. but they are, they grow as organically as possible. And so a lot of them will use the phrase, no spray, right? Um, yeah. which means, so if you're buying their potatoes, hopefully they're not sprayed with Roundup um, or they're sprayed for a Colorado potato beetle. Um, but you, you just do. Farmers don't mind you asking them. They really don't. Um, and we want you to ask. And I love it when someone comes up to my style and they ask, were these blackberries sprayed? And, you know, sometimes, sometimes they are. And you have to tell them what, why something was sprayed and with what kind of chemical, whether it was an organic based, you know, um, or, or you didn't use anything. So, yeah, just ask them. And, um, and, and, and they should be honest with you, right? Okay. Okay, thanks, Marilyn. And if anybody wants to speak about keeping rabbit uh, animals and insects out, is <laughs> that a problem? <laughs> well, if you're having a little garden, it's, it's not too difficult to put up, uh, you know, stakes every 10 feet around the garden and then buy a couple rolls of um, chicken wire and just with a big stapler staple it onto the poles as you go around you need two people to do the job but it, it only takes an afternoon to do um, a, you know a little fence to keep chickens and we have a, a rabbit uh, a chicken problem here because my chickens will go into several of my gardens and and pull all the onions out and the carrots and <clears throat> Um, and, and things like, you know, they just, they love those young little tender greens, so they just love pulling them out, and they'll put a hole in every eggplant and a hole in every tomato, so we have to fence some of the gardens, chicken-proof them, so it would be the same for rabbits, although they do dig. <laughs> and incense, insects, keeping insects out is, a, a, that's a whole different discussion, because <laughs> yeah. there's, there's pests that, yeah, there's pests for every vegetable and every fruit. And it's you, that's what comes with experience, but it's good to go. So say you're growing potatoes, you really need to know that there is a potato beetle and they, I don't know if they live in soil or they scope, but they always seem to find your potato patch, <laughs> no matter if you just have a few potato plants or you have a field of them. So it's good to know the major pests and potato beetle and um, squash, this, the Japanese squash beetle and the cucumber beetle and flea beetles and fruit flies for berries are the big, big ones. And now we've got a new one called the leek moth, which will destroy onions, leeks, and garlic. So. Hmm. Fantastic. Yeah. So um, I think we'll move on to the next question now. We've got a question from Rebecca. Rebecca, go ahead. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me all? Very well. Yep. Okay. Um, for someone who used to garden as a hobby, uh, more 
So than anything, who's thinking about, you know, maybe gardening to produce just a couple of veggies like squash or tomatoes or beans for uh, a relatively, you know, decent yield for a small family. Um, like how big of a garden would, would one be looking at and how much money would you put into establishing the garden, especially the first year? Um, especially if you neglected your hobby for a couple of years too. <laughs> so I guess I'm wondering the size and the, and the cost and I guess the time and energy that would be uh, required, especially for the first year to kind of keep things at, um, at a level where you could actually produce something worth saying that you've actually produced. Well, um, <clears throat> squash or and zucchini, they're a huge plant. They're massive, but that's all you would need would be one for a family because you'll get several squash or several zucchini on one plant. Um, so that doesn't have to cost you anything. It will take space in your garden to do it. Um, but other things like peas or beans and tomatoes, they don't take up that much space, but they're quite expensive to buy at the grocery store. Um, so maybe you should plant the things that cost the most to buy and um, and then buy at the grocery store the stuff that is the least expensive um, to buy and and but take up a lot of room like potatoes take a lot of room because one plant would only make five or ten potatoes and well you could eat five or ten potatoes with a family of three or four in just one meal so you need a lot of potato plants you know to fill a couple hundred pound bags so you know you, you may just want to buy those but Hopefully you can find no spray ones. I would also probably uh, grow, um, if, if you like chard and kale, definitely grow that because you can cut it and, and it keeps coming back, right? Like you can, if you just um, per week or whatever, or the, depending on how, always leave at least five leaves, I would say. And uh, so that it's a really grateful plant to, to take from because there's always more. And, yeah. Fantastic. I think um, we'll go now to Stephen, who has a question. Go ahead, Stephen. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I think I need to press a button. Okay, go ahead, Stephen. Can you hear me, yeah? Yes. Okay, I, I nearly forgot my question there. Um, we're thinking of, of planting potatoes, and I'm struggling to get any actual growing potatoes in, in a, uh, Avery's. Um, is there any particular brand of potato people would recommend for a raised bed, which is what we're using? Um, most of the potato seed that you're buying at the um, uh, feed stores or the garden stores are treated. So they're treated for scab. So if you want organic potatoes, Vessi Seeds actually has a beautiful supply of um, yellow, white, and red potatoes. They also have a few um, unique varieties like the um, little thin ones, I forget what they're called, and, and they have red ones or blue ones or whatever. Um, I love the Vessi seeds. They're, they're really good and you can get treated and untreated ones or organic ones. And they're not shipping them yet um, because they won't ship until it's a little bit warmer than this. So it's perfect time to order seed potatoes from Vessi's right now. Vessi's, did you say? Pardon me? Did you say, sorry, Marilyn, did you say it was Betsy's? Um, Vessi. Vessi Seeds from PEI. Right, yes. okay. Yes, they're in the list that is of uh, resources for seeds and seedlings, second last. That's how they spell it. Oh, oh yeah. I see. Yeah. Right, okay. Thank you for that. Yeah. You're welcome. Uh, Tara, go ahead. You have a question? Yeah. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. So I'm trying to decide how to proceed. Um, I've just uh, gotten a, I'm just in a new house. I'm, I'm north facing and the front lawn drops off in a very sharp kind of a curve down into a ditch before getting to the road. And um, I'm knocking my earphones out. And the back is, uh, I've got a beautiful little wooded area in the back 
which is south facing but is all shade because i've got all of these mm -hmm. big beautiful gorgeous trees <laughs> that it would break my heart to cut down <laughs> so i i'm so i'm looking for um i'm looking for vegetables i can grow in the dark <laughs> <laughs> so it's a bit of a challenge <laughs> um, uh, unless anyone has suggestions for amending gravel I'm going to be probably doing raised beds but I, I was going to being where it's my first year in the property I don't know where the sun hits and doesn't hit and I'm thinking I might just have to do a little bit of experimenting and I was just going to do a few little pots sitting around and just kind of keep it limited but now with this whole you know the world turning upside down business I'm thinking maybe I should ramp it up and move forward boldly but so I was thinking about having putting some I have some hemlock boards I can put across the very front where that dips down and just put a pile of topsoil in and thanks for all the information on where to find that that was great um, and then see how things go see where there is and isn't sun in the summer because I haven't been here for a summer yet and then move it as necessary but I don't know if I'm just setting myself up for like you know a whole lot of work that's going to have to be undone and redone anyway if anybody has any suggestions for me and also where I am going to be uh, growing seeds and there's going to be a fair bit of dappled light and not as much sunlight as I really ought to have. Um, yeah. If anyone has I don't think there's any veg. Yeah. I don't think there's any vegetables that do well in the shade, unfortunately. Um, yeah. But on your north facing lawn, lots of things grow facing north. A lot of fields are facing north and they do fine as long as you get the eastern sun in the morning and the western sun at night mm. coming across so tomorrow it's supposed to be nice all day so you could keep an mm. eye on that lawn and see where the sun hits it um, because you could have a, a nice little garden down by the road That's what I'm I thinking. hate to see you have to to move it or to take it apart or get yeah. discouraged the other option for you too if you really wanted to is you could ask you know somebody that you know if they have a little bit of land and they would just open up a garden for you mm. for this year um, and you could do, you know do a few things experimentally on someone else's land <laughs> too there's lots yeah. of people that are, have farms that would be willing and there's lots of people in Kings County with big backyards huge mm. backyards some people are sitting on five or ten acres um, and they're mowing it and mm -hmm. you know maybe those some of those people are going to start thinking about maybe putting in gardens so you could share a space with another another gardener if you wanted to as well it's an option yeah uh, I have found the one thing that does seem to do okay even in a fair bit of shade is kale you could grow kale oh, does it? okay I, I, I've never I, tried to grow it in shade yeah <laughs> well I mean it wasn't complete shade but yeah, I, I grew some last year in a place that was even less conducive to uh, to growing vegetables, and uh, I I think I'd only got like two or three three hours of sun a day maybe, and I mean it didn't look like my kale the previous year in a different location, but it did astonishingly well. Oh good. Oh thanks for peas and chard. Somebody's saying yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So Tara, thank you. Yeah. You a question: Whereabouts do you live? I'm in uh, Coldbrook. In Coldbrook. Um, Hayes subdivision, yeah. sort of behind the school off English Mountain Road. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because I know there, there there are some community gardens around where you if, but that's a I'm thinking of Port Williams, but that's quite a long trip for you. So it is. Not, not too practical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And things have well, gone well. We're not very well. far from you. <laughs> we're very close to you, actually. So we have we have a lot of land here, and, okay. and I don't have I don't have existing garden space because you know it's chock block full. Yeah. But, you know, there's no reason in the world we can't open up a little patch for somebody, you know, to have a garden in. So um, yeah, you can you can sort of let me know, but I'm I would be about a ten minute drive from you, and you would have to come once a week to tend your garden. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, once a week only. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> At least. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> Dep depends if the squash bugs find it. <laughs> it's twice a day then. <laughs> well, that was amazing. Thank you, Marilyn. That's amazing. Thank we're all you. gonna we're all gonna come to Marilyn's house now. But I think that I'm gonna I'm gonna turn to a question um, from Darren. Darren, go ahead. Yeah, can everybody hear me? Absolutely. Yeah, right on. Well, like uh, a lot of um, <clears throat> amateur gardeners, pretty anxious to uh, to get going with something. And I know that there was some discussion earlier about starting uh, with uh, cold vegetables and onions and things like that. But uh, can anybody just maybe uh, give some general guidelines about uh, when other vegetable plants could be started? indoors and uh, whether it's, you know, a worthwhile effort, uh, you know, given our growing conditions. Um, okay, um, broccoli, start it now and nice. put it out mid-May. Same as all the curcubits, so that's the broccoli, cauliflower, cabbages, Brussels sprouts. They're all the same family, they're very cold tolerant. You can plant them out here in Nova Scotia mid-May. Um, I mulch them with straw and uh, I put row covers over mine but it, that may be something you can do or you can't do but um, you don't have to worry about that right now but so that's th those ones and then carrots uh, actually get planted before the end of April mm -hmm. or early May um, by seed uh, same as potatoes they can get planted late April early May they can get planted in July just depends on when you want to harvest them right, right. Um, onions can get planted um, or, or mid-May I would say I think that's when I put them in um, spinach beets lettuces they can go out pretty soon actually uh, end of April you're saying um, go actually go outside you mean they can actually be seeded Oh, started like beets, you seed them. Yeah, the ones you the ones you seed in cell packs are onions, broccoli, cauliflower, um, your cabbages, Brussels sprouts, peppers, tomatoes, um, your herbs. You should start them inside, and also um, uh, just trying to think now what I'm doing next. <laughs> um, Onion, yeah, all your onions and leeks and all that, that's done first. Yeah, but carrots and beans and peas, corn, uh, beets, um, chard, they, uh, they, they, they all direct seed in the garden. Um, and corn and beans and all your pumpkins and squash and cucumbers, they're very cold sensitive. So I don't even put them in cell packs until mid to late April. Because um, they won't go out into the garden, they won't get planted as transplants into the garden until like early June, when all danger of frost is over. Right. So most of the seed packets have that very, very basic information on them about when to plant them. And they'll say when all danger of frost is when you plant them or put the cell pack or the transplant out. So that basic information is on there so you don't lose them in one single day because you put them out too early. Right on. Any predictions this year as to when all things are frost might be? <laughs> uh, it's always a gamble. <laughs> so that's a joy of farming. <laughs> it's a gamble. Many times I've had to go out and cover tomato plants. You know, it's good that they're little baby ones, you know, but um, yeah, you've had a late frost and you have to go out there at dusk and you have to get them covered because you're getting a frost or there's a risk of frost. Um, it's sort of just a rule of thumb. You know, lettuces and spinach and chard and kale and, and broccoli, they're very cold tolerant. They don't mind being out there. Even onions don't mind it being really cold. And carrots don't mind it being really cold and potatoes. But there's certainly ones that do, like the beans and pumpkins and stuff and eggplant and tomatoes, peppers. Great, thank you. Okay. Fantastic. Any other? Uh, well, we perhaps we'll go to our next question. And it's from Leslie. Leslie, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, am I unmuted? You are. I, okay. Um, I have a question about black currant bushes. Um, I wish to plant a number of them, but it's for my own consumption. I will share too. Um, 
I'm just wondering about how many and do they need full sun or do they prefer some shade? I grew some black currants uh, at our farm. Uh, for one family or oh, even two plants gives you a lot of fruit. Like um, probably, would you be making jam with it? Probably. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to think how many jars. I would have to look it up, but is, there's uh, a lot of jars of jam, like more than the first thing I did in a year, I think, with two plants. Um, so don't do more than, than, than two, I would say. Um, we had them in, um, it wasn't full sun, I guess, because they were growing. This was a, a garden. No. It was growing underneath a plum tree, or they were. Um, so they did have some, but palm tree, I guess, was grown to the to the, the northwest. So they had some well for most of the day. But yeah, it's, okay. may want to Google it and see. <laughs> but, yeah. uh, Thank you. Fantastic. And now we'll go to a question from Thomas. Hi, um, I was just wondering, I've, I've got seeds that ha have acquired over a number of, of different years and some of them are, are last years and some of them I've taken out of plants that I grew myself. Is there any way to pre-test the seed to see whether it's, it's good other than just putting it in and waiting to see if it sprouts? You can try sprouting them. Um, so you can put them on a, a tissue like a, or a paper towel and and wet it and see if if they will sprout and it's a good a good good way of testing to see if they're viable but um so some seeds are viable for much longer than others like your tomato seeds will probably be okay but as marilyn said earlier your onion seeds will be and most flower seeds won't be like you will have to buy them every year does that work for just about everything leone that that method of of putting them on a paper towel and seeing if they sprout I, I, what do you think, Marilyn? I, well, I think you could put them in your little cell packs. And if uh, most things will germinate within two to three weeks, some, some are five days, right? Just if you have the instruction or you still have the little seed packet, some, some will say germination, you know, is, is five days or some is three weeks. If it doesn't come out of the soil by then, then you know that that, uh, those seeds are probably too old and you should discard them and get new ones. Um, just make sure that the soil is nice and moist and then in a bright space and that there's a bright light over it and, uh, and try it like that. Okay. Thanks. Fantastic. Well, um, oh, we have, an, we have a question from Eve. Eve, go ahead. Uh, hi, um, so I live in Halifax, so we have absolutely trash soil and also our house is surrounded on all sides by very tall trees. So um, what I mostly do is gardening on our deck, which is pretty much the only like fairly sunny area. So um, I have a question about um, potting soil mix. Um, so I don't like to buy any of the commercial potting soil mixes because I don't know of any without um, peat moss in them. Um, and so I make up my own mixes using coconut coir in place of uh, peat moss. But um, of course there's, coconut coir is a lot more nutrient poor than peat is. So uh, I was curious what, um, I usually mix in um, feather meal and soft drop phosphate. Uh, I was curious if there's, like what you would recommend for nutrient amendments. Mm, well, I don't know anything about the coke. I'm just wondering, is is there a reason you don't like to use peat moss? Because they have wonderful growing mixes. I'm not talking about the little bags that you buy at the grocery store or whatever, but, you know, your your cubic, three cubic bales of grower mix. Um, but they have, like, um, little little white little balls in it just to keep put air. I mean, that's it's really giving your little plants the best start, um, and you don't really need to add anything. So. So once you start trying, because I did that originally too, I made my own soil and put, 
and I used a bit of peat moss, and it just was disastrous because um, unless you really know exactly how much to put in, those are all very, very balanced and will give you the best start. And then you can make your own special soil in your bigger pots outside and, um, and, and try it, you know, but get your little plants the best start that they can using a, a medium that's already mixed by professionals. And peat moss comes from Nova Scotia. So... Yeah, I just, um, I, I, I worry a lot about um, the over-harvesting of peat bogs and the, like just climate-related reasons. I really don't want to support the mining of um, peat bogs. Yes, okay. <clears throat> Yeah, I, I can't. I'm not sure I can really help you with what okay. to put in with your mix because the coconut is. I'm, I'm not familiar with that at at all. And uh, yeah, wh whether it has any nutrient value in it at all, other than it just aerates the soil. Uh, mostly, but, it's um, just a structural replacement for peat moss. Um, the, all the nutrients come from the uh, compost and any other amendments that I mix in. Um, um, yeah, I mean, you can just use straight compost too. I mean, that that's wonderful. Um, just to straight and and put some of your coconut in it, and just buy a really good bale of compost then, or get a small small delivery of it. Um, yeah, and there's yeah, also like, worm castings. Yeah, those are fantastic um, as a medium to start growing things in. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm also looking to start up um, a raised bed this year. Um, uh, so I'm curious, I was thinking of doing like a lasagna, a lasagna kind of composting method, um, but would you recommend that I also add in topsoil, not just compost materials for that, or? When I use well, that, because of how, yeah, yeah, go ahead, I'll let someone else answer that. Yeah, I'm not really sure, yeah, what to tell you. When, when I used that method, um, we, I didn't buy any topsoil. I just really used the, um, well, the permaculture method of, of layering uh, with different materials, and, and that worked really well. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, we're going to go to a question from Judy. Oh, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Uh, thanks, everyone. This has been really great. Uh, very inspiring. Um, I just have a question about growing berries. And as a big sort of, you know, I have some gardening experience, haven't done anything for a long time. I'm up on the North Mountain. Um, just wondering about what berries you would recommend that are sort of forgivable, don't need, I also have a, almost a single parent, so I won't be able to give a lot of attention. Um, so I'm looking for, you know, crops that, that are sort of fairly forgivable, um, you know, don't need a lot of, of care. Um, so I was just curious about berries. Um, black currants were mentioned. I'm curious about strawberries and raspberries. Blueberries are kind of the obvious ones. So I'm just wondering of those, which ones you might recommend? Well, or if there's others. Fruit, fruit, fruit growing is difficult, isn't it? It everything wants to eat them, so it, it, it they are always a challenge. There's always pests for fruit, um, and so there are different level of once you get into them. There's a lot of failures in fruit because of pests, and the biggest one in Nova Scotia is the uh, the two spotted winged Drosophila fruit fly, and that is now penetrating and laying eggs into unripe fruit. And so by the time the blackberry or the blackcurrant or the strawberry is ripe, it's already rotting right on the bush. Um, mm -hmm. And so if, if it doesn't find you the first year or two, it will eventually find you and then it overwinters in, in the little bushes in the yard. So having physical barriers or organic sprays, you know, f for that is almost essential and that is so discouraging for people who just want to have a little bit of fruit but the reality is we have a lot of fruit growers in Kings County and they're using a lot of chemicals and we have a lot of pests and they will go leave a farm that is using chemical sprays and they will come to your farm mm -hmm. where there is no sprays and they will come in huge numbers and so it's very discouraging for fruit growers that are trying to do no, no spray or organic 
So it's the biggest expense on our farm is putting up physical barriers or, um, you know, we even have problems with birds here, you know, so if the bugs don't get them, the birds do. So you have to buy netting and it's just on and on and on and on. And, and, and fruit can be very rewarding, but it can also be very, very discouraging. Again, I would just start small so that if you do need to jump in and mitigate some impacts from insects, it will cost you very little, you know, so if you do need to get a road cover. So the easiest plants, the berries that I've ever grown were hascaps, you, but you do need to have at least three varieties, two or three varieties. I have four varieties and they do extremely well in Nova Scotia. They're very full of antioxidants. They have very few pests except birds, but netting is extremely cheap for them. So it's a good one. Strawberries are easy, but they're laden with chemicals. Um, there's just no way you can get away from getting strawberries at a nursery or a garden shop that don't have been soaked in chemicals. Um, but if you want, you know, strawberries, they they usually beat the fruit fly. They're usually coming before the, before the fruit fly gets them. So, um, yeah. Um, blackberries are the worst. Yeah, for fruit fly and stuff. Yeah, the later fruit is the worst. Yeah. Okay. So. And I'm seeing seeds for strawberries, which surprises me in the seed catalogs. Um, do people start them from seed to avoid that that chemical issue, or is that hard? To I'm do? sure you could. I yeah. If you are lucky, let me know, Judy, because they. Uh, I've never tried to grow them by seed before. Yeah. So we used to buy them as bare root plants, um, which are also treated. So um, because we were certified organic, um, we could not we, we ha actually had to mention or state that our first year berries were not certified organic for that reason. Um, but they're I, I, I imagine they're a lot less sprayed than if you actually buy the plant that already has you know buds on it or whatever from uh, from greenhouses. I don't know what, uh, uh, yeah, so because ours were, I guess what we would buy the bare roots ones are grown the year before from seeds and then they're uh, kept in the freezer. I don't know if that's, uh, if you have any, um, um, if you know any places where you can buy those, Marilyn, around here. Not organic ones. I don't know any grower who does organic strawberry plants. But the bare root ones, do you know anyone who sells those by like 1500 plants in a box? Not, they're not organic. They're all, they're all, they're all treated and there's several chemicals on them. Okay. Yeah. And the house I, I tried, you just can't. So I, I gave up. I just buy the ones that you get from the, the big nurseries here. Okay. Like yeah. the, the Charles, yeah, Keddy Nurseries or GW Allen. Um, they they do a lot of nursery plants, but it's hard now to get them because they've been the farms have already ordered all of them, and so they may have a few of a few different varieties, little bits here and there of them left. But hmm. it, you may not get the variety that you want because the orders were supposed to be placed, you know, last in over the, the yeah. winter. Yeah, I guess the ones that we bought came from California. They did, they did not have pesticides, but they had fertilizer. Or they, like a, right, yeah. Like that was the problem. I don't even know if you can get those kind here, but if you can, that would be fantastic. But they would probably be quite expensive. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, just a quick question about the house caps. Where would you source those, Marilyn? Oh, we got ours, to Judy, from... Um, the uh, nursery in um, just outside of Berwick, Briar Patch. Oh yeah, okay. They had some nice ones. They had some lovely ones actually, and um, also um, Glad Gardens right. are the closest ones to you. They also sell hascaps, I believe. And you said you need just three. get. I would just get one of each plant, you know, and just get the four and put them in. You have loads and loads of berries, and they grow fast. And within a few years, they're really prolific. And the netting is easy, and I don't. Up until last year, I've never had a pest problem, but I, I did this year. So we had, to, we had to treat with a dormant oil in the fall, and, and I'll do it again probably um, sometime this month, and uh, hopefully that will take care of it. And last question, when should those go in the ground? Uh, I think May is a really good time for most fruit bushes, just when it's starting to be pretty decent. Okay, great. Thank yeah. you so mid, much. mid to late May, yeah. Okay, I think uh, we'll be going now to our last question. Um, Garuda, would you like to ask your question? 
um, which trees grow well in Woofville? Because it seems to me that that would be a really good uh, answer to Eve's questions. Um, in terms are you talking about a fruit tree, tree or a nut trees? Are you talking about fruit trees? Actually, particularly nut trees, but also fruit trees. This, this is the time oh, to make orders for, uh, from like Charlie the Tree Guy and others uh, for, for trees. It takes longer to get, uh, to get up to be growing, but then uh, you get set so many years of benefit. Yeah, I, I don't know myself anything about nut trees, um, but I do know quite a bit about tree fruit, orchard fruit. Um, they can get, you know, a fairly big size that is too big to spray. And, um, I mean, Leone can probably weigh in, but it it is really a struggle to, to raise trees, fruit trees, without putting any kind of spray on them. There are organic sprays like, you know, copper sulfate and Bordeaux and, and a variety of, you know, uh, other things they put on them for fungal diseases and whatnot. But I don't know of anybody who can grow a fruit tree without pruning it every year and spraying it you just won't get any fruit that's that's eatable you know like all the peaches get peach leaf you know peach leaf pearl and then your fruit just rots plus we've got the fruit fly plus we've got mites we've got everything here um and fruit trees require a a, a ton of care um every year and you know, they're just, they can be just such a disaster. They can be the ugliest looking tree in your yard if they're uncared for and they spread disease. And where, you know, King County has ideal climate for, for fruit, true fruit, orchard fruit, um, you know, somebody, you know, the Department of Agriculture can actually come and take your tree away if it's diseased or, or you know, kind of enforce you to cut it down. So I don't recommend that people put fruit, you know, uh, orchard fruit trees in their backyard. Nut trees may be something totally different, but fruit trees require so much care, um, and they do require some kind of spraying. And is it, uh, you know, we have a cherry tree in our backyard that previous owners who didn't farm this farm decided to plant, and it's really a hassle even to get the dormant oil on it. So, you know, it, they we can have some fruit on it, but we gave up and cut it down, you know, and. It, they're just a nuisance to have them um, without being able to spray them. And, and they're hard to spray. You can't do it with a backpack sprayer when they get, you know, like 12, 15 feet high. I bet you could have good success with pawpaws. Uh, they're not a commercial tree, so you're not going to have the, all the, the uh, problems brought in by the commercial growers. And uh, uh, I know they grow well here. And... Uh, okay. They are accessible, and they taste like a mango. Oh wow! I don't know anything about them, so that would be that would be great. They, yeah, they wouldn't compete with any of the fruit growers here <laughs> at all, and I don't know what they would have for pests either. So, yeah. Well, they uh, they're they're not a marketable fruit either because uh, they don't keep. They're you know when you they bruise easily, they don't transport. Um, you just you can give them to your neighbors, but they just really have to be eaten on the spot or are canned or dried. But they're delicious and they're native to North America and they're available. Uh, I'm, ha I'm having good success with my uh, one row of, of um, uh, grapes, uh, just a small amount and uh, it's, it's easy to do as well. Yeah, we have grapes, but they, they do get powdery mildew, and, and the birds love them. So we have to put nets. We have to, we have to net them um, uh, when it's ripe. So there's all it, it expenses with it. It's sort of if you're looking for easy food, the easiest thing and the most satisfying for gardeners is vegetables. So generally easy to grow. There's a few tough ones like celery sometimes can be discouraging or getting your peppers to ripen if it's not a, you know, a really nice hot summer. But you know, fruit is, is a challenge. But we have really good soils here for blueberries. We, they love acid soil. You can't get it acid enough. And strawberries grow really well here. And grapes, once they get grown, going, they're really hardy. Um, your chances of losing your crop is way higher than with vegetables, I would say. So it's just, it's not that I don't think people should try it. It's just to be very aware of and be checking it often for pests and problems. Um, 
so that you can get jump on it and get it, get it looked after. But it's really hard to get a neighbor farm to come and spray one tree in your backyard because it's loaded with mites. It's just not going to happen, and you're going to lose your tree. So, the other crop that was traditionally promoted uh, uh, in the uh, Victory Garden approach was chickens. Uh, <laughs> all sorts of, of posters from that era uh, uh, saying two chickens per person and have the little kids take care of the chickens and on and on and on. So uh, exactly. Uh, and, and that's a great topic for a follow up uh, learning event. And I think the that uh, transition uh, St. Margaret's Bay will that you will have an event on small uh, animal farming. Yes, uh, uh, coming up fairly soon. I just posted the link to it and the, the times, and it will be a Zoom event as well. You're all welcome to come into it, and we're going to be looking at uh, kind of two approaches, uh, more chickens than anything, but also sheep, goats, and bees. Uh, but two, the two different approaches to chickens are, one, if you have just a few hens, and maybe a rooster in, in your backyard, uh, and uh, they're pets with benefits. Um, and uh, the other is um, you have a, enough of a flock that you might have separate layers and uh, layers, and you're, you're eating all of them as well. Uh, so uh, eating them all is part of it. So yeah, please, everyone, uh, uh, follow that and, and jo join in when we do this. And Absolutely. And uh, anyone who contacts us by email looking for follow-up information will include the information to uh, join in the uh, Transition St. Margaret's Bay event on small animals. Now, I'd promised that we had had our last question with the last question, but Barbara would really like to ask a question. And so Barbara will have the last question. Go, go ahead. Thanks for fitting me in. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. We have a horse farm, so I have plentiful uh, composted horse manure for our garden. I'm wondering if anybody has any advice on, um, you know, the appropriate amounts to use or <coughs> what I can amend that with as well. Well, <laughs> um, yeah, in the, um, we made our own compost at our farm and we were eventually self-sufficient by using our goats and chicken uh, manure. Um, but we, did, we didn't use it up straight and we did mix it in with other things. So, um, so what we would do is uh, we would add any sort of weeds that we have. So layer it, like a layer of uh, manure, the layer of weeds, layer of grass clippings if you have it. Uh, some ashes from the fire you can sprinkle on top of it. You can put, you know, your compostables on there too if you have them. But you have to make it all, you know, like we would do a, a, a heap and, and, and make it, or five at the same, if we had enough uh, materials for them but all at once so that's the key that you don't you know because you, you want it to get hot um right away uh because it won't reach the temperature of 130 fahrenheit um if you do it too slowly if you do it over the course of several days or, or for sure several weeks and, and you want to reach that temperature in order to um kill all the you know the weed seeds or the the um what are those things that horses eat against worms? The, you know, like the, the medication or GMOs or, or whatever. But definitely, um, yeah, do, do uh, mix in other materials as well so that it becomes like a, a full spectrum compost in the end. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. So now I'd just like to give a huge thank you uh, to our panelists, to Marilyn and Leone and David for sharing all of your expertise with everyone today. I learned a lot. Thank you to everyone who also included great information and resources in the group chat. I'll archive that. Uh, we did record today, so if you miss something, you'll have a chance to go back 
and watch it again. We'll find ways to make that recording available uh, on Facebook and eventually on our website when we get it up and running. The slide that I have up now, just as our closing slide, says learn by doing. And there's just so many ways to develop your food self-sufficiency that you know maybe are a little bit different from, from what we've been talking about now. You can volunteer on a farm like Joel's farm, Marilyn's farm. Uh, many people have small farms and they're part of our Climate Circle community. Uh, in uh, the Annapolis Valley, Eastern Annapolis Valley area. If you want to know what climate circles are about, they're about anything that we need to do to have a more resilient, inclusive, and empowered community going forward. And uh, we're on Facebook, Climate Circles Annapolis Valley East, and we meet by Zoom every Monday night at 7 p.m. And everyone is most welcome. The transition will fill an area is part of the climate circles. We came from that. Um, we've now come forward uh, as a, a community of our own transition will fill area and we have a new email address and there it is. So reach out to us by email and we'll be also having a presence soon on Facebook. Well, we have a presence on Facebook, but a more active presence on Facebook and a website, as I said. Um, Extinction Rebellion King's Hands is very active. We've been working to get our communities to declare a climate emergency and had some success with that this winter. Reach out if you want to get involved. And so thanks to everyone and have a great evening. Congratulations. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It was awesome. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.